There is, in the legends of the Scandinavians, a marvellous record of the coming of the comet. It has been repeated generation after generation, translated into all languages, commented on, criticised, but never truly understood. It has been regarded as a wild, unmeaning rhapsody of words, a riddle, or as a premonition of some future Earth catastrophe. But just look at it, the very name is significant. According to Professor Anderson's etymology of the word, Ragnarok means the darkness of the gods. From the word rain, meaning gods, and rocker, meaning darkness. That would be the rock and the flood of the gods. That would also be the rain in the reign of the empire. Let us not forget that Odin in High German is Zoo. And the darkness, the black bird, is also named Zoo, alternatively known as Rock. Very similar to Loki and Odin, who share the name Othella. Odin and Zoo share the name Zoo, meaning the darkness. But Rock in this context may more properly be derived from the Icelandic, Danish and Swedish green, a rain, and rock, smoke, or dust. And it may mean the rain of dust, for the clay in our ground first came as dust. It is described in some Indian legends as ashes. First there is, as in the traditions of the Druids, the story of an age of crime. This was after the fall of rock. The Vala looks upon the world, and, as the Elder Edda tells us, there saw she weighed in the heavy streams, men, foul murderers, and perjurers. and them whose others' wives seduce to sin. Brothers slay brothers, sisters, children, shed each other's blood. Hard is the world, sensual sin grows huge. There are sword ages, axe ages, shields are cleft in twain. Storm ages, murder ages, till the world falls dead and men no longer spare or pity one another. The world has ripened for destruction, and Ragnarok, the darkness of the gods, or the reign of dust and ashes, comes to complete the work. The whole story is told with the utmost detail, and we shall see that it agrees in almost every particular with what reason assures us that this event must have happened. There are three winters or years during which great wars rage over the world. Mankind has reached a climax of wickedness. Doubtless that it was, as it is now, highly civilized in some regions, while still barbarian in others. Then what happens next will seem like a great miracle. The wolf devours the sun. And this will seem like a great loss. That is, the comet strikes the sun, or approaches so close to it that it seems to do so. The other wolf devours the moon, and this too will cause great mischief. Isn't it Odin that has two wolves? In Norse mythology, Geri and Freki from Old Norse, both meaning the ravenous or greedy one. They are the two wolves which are said to accompany the god, Odin. There is a tale of two wolves 
but there appear to be three. We have seen that the comets often come in couples or triplets. The stars shall be hurled from the heaven. This refers to the blazing debris of the comet falling to earth. Then it shall come to pass that the earth will shake so violently that the trees will be torn up by the roots. The mountains will topple down and all bonds and fetters will be broken and snapped. Chaos has come again. How closely does all this agree with Hesiod's description of the shaking of the earth and the universal conflict of nature? The Fenris Wolf Gets Loose The Fenris Wolf is the name of one of the comets. The sea rushes over the earth, for the Midgard Serpent writhes in giant rage and seeks to gain the land. The Midgard Serpent is the name of another comet. It strives to reach the earth. Its proximity disturbs the oceans. And then follows an inexplicable piece of mythology. The ship that is called Naglafar also becomes loose. This would be the Ark, wouldn't it? But here it is made from the nails of dead men. Wherefore, it is worth warning that when a man dies, he supplies a large amount of materials for the building of this ship. This is one very dark vessel, which both gods and men wish that it may be finished as late as possible. But during this great flood, Naglafar gets afloat. The giant Hiram is the steersman. The Fenris Wolf advances with a wide open mouth. The upper jaw reaches to the heaven, and the lower jaw is on the earth. That is to say, the comet extends from the earth to the sun. He would open it wider if he had room. Fire flashes from his eyes and nostrils. Another writer says, the Midgard Serpent vomits forth venom. Defiling all the air and the sea, he is very terrible, and places himself side by side with the wolf. The two comets move together, and they give out poison. In the midst of the clash and din, the heavens are rent in twain, and the sons of Muspelheim come riding through the opening. Muspelheim according to Professor Anderson, means the Day of Judgment. Muspel signifies an abode of fire, peopled by fiends. So that this passage means that the heavens are split open, or appear to be, by the great shining comet, or comets, striking the earth. It is a world of fire. It is the Day of Judgment. Sutur rides first, and before him and after him, flames of burning fire. Sutur is a demon associated with the comet. He is the same as the destructive god of the ancient Egyptians, who destroys the sun. It may mean the blazing nucleus of the comet. He has a very good sword that shines brighter than the sun. Where have we seen that before? I can't put my finger on it. As they ride over the Bifrost, it breaks into pieces. The Bifrost, we shall have reason to see hereafter, that it was a prolongation of land westward from Europe, which connected the British Islands with the island home of the gods, or a godlike race of men. There are geological proofs that such a land once existed. A writer, Thomas Butler Gunn, in an old English publication, says, Tennyson's voyage of Maeldon is a magnificent allegorical expansion of the idea, and this distinction has also finally commemorated the old belief.
in the country of Lyoness, extending beyond the bounds of Cornwall, UK. A land of old, upheaven from the abyss, by fire to sink into the abyss once again, where fragments of forgotten people dwelt, and the long mountains ended in the coast of ever-shifting sands, and far away the phantom circle of a moaning sea. Cornishmen of the last generation used to tell stories of strange household relics picked up at very low tides. Even the quaint habitants seen fathoms deep in the water. The Edda may be interpreted to mean that the comet strikes the planet west of Europe and crushes down some land in that quarter called the Bridge of Bifrost. Then follows a mighty battle between the gods and the comet. It can have, of course, only one termination, but it will recur again and again in the legends of different nations. It was necessary that the gods, the so-called protectors of mankind, should struggle to defend them against these strange and terrible enemies. But their very helplessness and their death show how immense the calamity was which had befallen the world. The Edda continues. The sons of Muspel direct their course to the plain which is called Vigrid, who repair also the Fenris wolf and the Midgard serpent. The comets have fallen to the earth. They repaired them. In relation to the Ark of the Covenant, I believe they learned to harness the power of the meteor. This would be why the Ark of the Covenant was hidden. Oddly enough, the comets have fallen on the Earth. To this place has also come Loki. So this would be like Lugal Banda searching for the Anzu bird, which then possesses him with great power. Loki, the evil genius of Norse mythology, and with him all the frost giants, the Jotun. In Loki's company are the friends of Hel, the goddess of death. The sons of Muspel have their efficient bands alone by themselves. The plain of Vigrid is 100 miles on each side. That is to say, all of these evil forces, the comet, the fire, the devil and death, have taken possession of this great plain, the heart of the civilized land. The scene is located in this spot, because probably it was from this spot that the legends were afterwards dispersed to all the world. It is necessary for the defenders of mankind to rouse themselves. There is no time to be lost. And accordingly, we learn, while these things are happening, Heimdall, he was the guardian of the Bifrost Bridge. He stands up, blows with all his might in the Gyala Horn, and awakens all the gods, who thereupon hold counsel.
Odin rides to Mimir's well to ask for advice from Mimir for himself and his folk. Then quivers the ash Yggdrasil, and all things in heaven and earth tremble. The ash Yggdrasil is the tree of life. The tree of the ancient tree worship, the tree which stands on the top of the pyramid in the island birthplace of the Aztec race. The tree is also referred to in the Hindu legends. The Azas, the godlike men, and the Ayunyas, the heroes, arm themselves and speed forth to the battlefield. Odin rides first with his golden helmet, resplendent Pyrni, Gungnir. He advances against the Ferris Wolf, the first comet. Thor stands by his side, but can give him no assistance, for he has his hands full in his struggle with the Midgard Serpent, the second comet. Frey encounters Sutur, and heavy blows are exchanged. Here, Frey falls. The cause of his death is that he has not the good sword which he gave to Skirna. Even the dog Garm, another comet that was bound before Gnipna Cave, gets loose. He is the greatest plague. He contends with Tyre the previous name of Odin, and they kill each other. It is worth noting that Tyre is named the leavings of a wolf. Could this be the comet that lay burning on the earth? Meaning the leavings of the wolf is the power granted by the comet. Thor receives great renown by slaying the Midgard serpent but retreats only nine paces when he falls to the earth, dead, poisoned by the venom that the serpent blows upon him. The wolf swallows Odin and thus causes his death. But Vidar immediately turns and rushes at the wolf, placing one foot on his nether jaw. On this foot he has the shoe for which the materials have been gathering through all ages, namely the stripes of leather which men cut off from the toes and heels of shoes. Wherefore he who wishes to render assistance to the Azas must cast these stripes away. This last paragraph, like that concerning the ship Naglafar, is probably the interpolation of some later age. Britain had 500 years of invasion. With one hand, Vidar seizes the upper jaw of the wolf, and thus rends asunder his mouth, and the great wolf perishes. Loki fights with Heimdall, and they kill each other. Thereupon, Sutur flings fire over the earth and burns up all of the world. This narrative is from the Younger Edda. The Elder Edda is to the same purpose, but here there are more allusions to the effects of the catastrophe on the earth. And this is why my mention of Zoo should not be dismissed so easily. From the Elder Edda, the eagle screams, and with pale beak tears corpses. The heroes go all the way to hell, and heaven is rent in twain, and all men abandon their homesteads. When the warder of Midgard in wrath slays the serpent, the sun grows dark, the earth sinks into the sea. The bright stars from heaven vanish. Fire rages, heat blazes, 
and the high flames against heaven itself. The sun grows dark. This would be the black sun. But what follows this? The ice, the cold, the winter. Although these things come first in the narrative of the Edda, yet we are told before these things, the cold winters, there occurred the wickedness of the world, and the wolves and the serpent made their appearance. So that these events transpired in the order in which I have presented them. First there is the winter, called the Fimble Winter, the mighty, the great, the iron winter. Winter is coming. When snow drives from all quarters, the frost is severe, the winds so keen, there is no joy in the sun. There are three winters in succession, without any intervening summer. Here we have the glacial period, which followed the drift, three years of incessant wind and snow and intense cold. The destruction, confusion and wickedness of winter are all caused by the fallen one. The Elder Edda, speaking of the Fenris wolf, it feeds on the bodies of men. When they die, the seat of the gods, it stains with red blood. This would be similar to Amit, to Hoot's devourer of the dead. But this probably refers to the iron-stained red clay cast down by the comet over a large part of the earth. This would be Orcha clay. The seats of the gods means the home of the godlike race was covered like Europe and America with red clay. The waters which ran from it must have been the color of blood the sunshine blackens in the summers thereafter, and the weather grows bad. In the Younger Edda, we are given a still more precise description of the Ice Age. Replied, Ha, ah, explaining that soon as the streams that are called Eli Vogs, meaning the rivers from under ice, had came so far that the venomous yeast could this be the red orca clay, which flowed with them, hardened, as does dross that runs from the fire, then it turned, as into ice. And when this ice stopped, and flowed no more, then gathered over it the drizzling rain that arose from the venom, and froze into rime, ice. And one layer of ice was laid upon another, into the Ginunga Gap. Ginungagap, we are told, was the name applied in the 11th century by the Northmen to the ocean between Greenland and Vinland or America. This doubtlessly meant originally the whole of the Atlantic Ocean. The clay, when it first fell, was probably full of chemical elements which rendered it. If this did come from out of space, these chemical elements are alien to Earth, and the waters which filtered through it are unfit for human use. Clay waters, to this day, are the worst in the world. If you believe that Earth is God, you should be aware that there is another who fell from the skies. There are indeed two powers on Earth. Back to Ginungagap. Then said Yafanhar, all the part of Ginungagap that turns to the north, the North Atlantic, 
was filled with thick, heavy ice and rime, and everywhere within were drizzling rains and gusts. But the south part of Ginunga Gap was lighted up by the glowing sparks that flew out of Muspelheim. Muspelheim. Muspelheim was the torrid country of the south over which the clouds could not yet form in consequence of the heat. This could be Egypt, Africa or Mesopotamia and I believe these regions were at war. But it can not last forever. The clouds disappear, the floods find their way back to the ocean, nature begins to decorate once more the scarred and crushed face of the world. But where is the human race? The younger Edda tells us, during the conflagration caused by Satur's fire, a woman by the name of Lif and a man named Lif Frazier lie concealed in Hodmimir's hold or forest. The dew of the dawn serves them for food, and so a great race shall spring from them, that their descendants shall soon spread over the whole earth. My mind has a problem here. The dew of the dawn. This is one of the names for zoo. I'll repeat that. The dew of the dawn serves them for food, and so a great race shall spring from them. What we see in Babylon is a possessing spirit, similar to the fallen angel. He wants to spread his seed all over the earth. Apparently, in reincarnation, you reincarnate on the planet you live on. There are two types of earth here. And in the magical occult works, there is a force craving form in our reality. The Elder Edda says, Lif and Lifthrazir will lie hid in Hodmimir's holt, the morning dew they have for food. From them are the races descended. Holt is a grove or forest or hold. It was probably a cave. We shall see that nearly all the legends refer to the caves in which mankind escaped from destruction. This statement, from them are the races descended, shows that this is not prophecy, but history. It refers to the past, not to the future. It describes not a day of judgment to come, but one that has already fallen on the human family. Two others of the godlike race also escaped in some way not indicated. Vidar and Vale are their names. They too had probably taken refuge in some cavern. Neither the sea nor Sutur's fire had harmed them and they dwelt on the plains of Ida where Asgard was before. The sons of Thor, Mode and Magni also came and they have Mjolnir. Mjolnir is Thor's hammer. Then come Balder and Hoda from Hell. They belong to the godlike race. They too have escaped. Baldur is the son. He has returned from the abode of the dead to which the comet consigned him. Hodur is the night.
All of this means that the fragments and remnants of humanity resemble on the plain of Ida, the plain of Vigrid, where the battle was fought. They possess the works of the old civilization. These works are represented by Thor's hammer. And the day and the night are once more, after the long midnight of blackness. And the Valar look again upon a renewed and rejuvenated world. She sees arise the second time from the sea, the earth completely green, the cascades fall, the eagle soars from lofty mounts, pursues its prey. This is very similar to the phoenix. It is once more the sunlighted world, the world of flashing seas, dancing streams and green leaves. With the eagle high above it all, batting the sunny ceiling of the globe with his dark wings. From this a new king arose, while the wild cataracts leap in glory. What history, what poetry, what beauty, what inestimable pictures of an infinite past that have lain hidden away in these sagas. The despised heritage of all the blue-eyed, light-haired races of the world. Rome and Greece cannot parallel this marvelous story. The gods convene on Ida's plains and talk of the powerful Midgard Serpent, the Fenris Wolf, and the mighty runes of the mighty Odin. What else could mankind think of, or dream of, or speak of for the next thousand years, but this awful unparalleled calamity through which the race has passed? A long subsequent, but most ancient and cultivated people, whose memory has, for us, almost faded from the earth, will thereafter embalm the great drama in legends, myth, prayer, poems and sagas, fragments of which are found today dispersed through all literatures in all lands. Some of them we shall see having found their way into the very Bible itself. The Edda continues, the wonderful golden tablets. In the tall grass. I have told you to watch in the tall grass, if you are old enough, of course. The wonderful golden tablets are found in the grass in the time's morning. The leader of the gods and Odin's race possessed them. This would be where black magic enters my narrative. Black by definition is darkness. And this would be how one would connect to the rock, meaning the darkness. And what a find that was. The poor remnant of humanity discovers the golden tablets of the former civilization. If they were found, their true purpose is left open for interpretation, very much like playing with fire. Doubtlessly, they were inscribed tablets by which this art of writing survived to the race. For what would tablets be without inscriptions? Possibly geometria and symbolic power. For they talk of the ancient runes of the mighty Odin, that is of the runic letters, the alphabetical writing. We shall see hereafter that this view is confirmed from other sources. There follows a happy age, the fields unsown yield their growth, 
All ills cease. Balder comes home. Hoder and Balder, those heavenly gods, dwell together in Odin's halls. The great catastrophe is past. Man is saved. The world is once more fair. The sun shines again in the heaven. Night and day follow each other in endless revolution around the happy globe. Ragnarok is past. I mentioned a druid possibly taking these tablets in a previous documentary. Here we have the elements of my theory once again. But here, the tablets are simply found. 